Disclaimer, the content of this webinar is for learning purposes only. The content of this webinar is not medical advice and cannot replace medical consultation and medical care. Please consult your medical provider to determine your unique medical condition and health care needs. Best wishes. Good evening, my dear friends, or good morning, or good afternoon, wherever you are in the globe. Uh, this evening, my time, uh, I'm going to speak about uh, a point which I found in my clinic uh, very, very useful for treating uh, Parkinson's disease. Well, basically, any disorder that I found that may be the cause of the problem is maybe low level levels of dopamine. So you can already there understand that it's not only for Parkinson's, which has got the motor function and some cognitive functions, but also could be very, very useful for patients that are feeling uh, fatigue or less of motivation, uh, kind of depression. Okay, so this point is actually also very effective in those, in those uh, disorders. So it, we're gonna, first this point, ZS point was discovered by a German physician, Dr. Dorothea Zaisus, MD. And she actually, when discovering this point, it goes through actually two phases. The first phase, which was the primary research or self, research that she done in a clinic. And she found that this point uh, was very, very useful for hormonal imbalance. And that was around 2007. And after I was actually in those years after I used, learned this ZS point was actually using it very, very effectively in treating hormonal uh, imbalance in females. And then in about 2014, 16, she actually discovered that this point also has some effect on the dopamine levels or has a dopagenic effect on a patient. So you can already understand her discovery that this point has an effect on the, on the dopamine levels of the patient, why it will be also affect, uh, affected in Parkinson uh, patients. So we'll go through that in the webinar uh, this evening. So, in general, when we come in to treat uh, Parkinson's in this case, you have to take into account that acupuncture is only, from my experience, only one part of the puzzle. It, it assists in the treatment. I like to say that a lot of times, uh, it's a sentence I actually heard from uh, Zhu, uh, Professor Zhu Ming-Ching of the uh, scalp acupuncture or the Zuzhu style of scalp acupuncture, he mentions that scalp acupuncture is like opening the lock of the door, okay? And then the patient has to walk through the lock, okay? And the walking through the lock is the exercises or uh, exercises the patient needs to do. So also in Parkinson's patient, it is very, very necessary uh, to combine different types of treatments to help uh, and improve the quality of life of the Parkinson patient. For example, cases and studies have shown that movement, dance, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, or any uh, movement or any activity that the uh, Parkinson patient is undergo undergoing actually improves and prolongs his state to be from moving from stage to stage. And if some patients even stay for a long period of time in a very good maintenance, in a very uh, high quality standard. And just, uh, just because they've been undergoing a multidisciplinary treatment. Okay, it could be also not only uh, 
manual therapy types, but also nutrition can have an effect on it. Uh, sleep uh, can have an effect. Emotional stress can have an effect. So you have this whole uh, capacity of uh, treatments or this whole package that these patients have to undergo. Uh, and uh, one of these, and one of one part of that puzzle is acupuncture, and another part of that puzzle is I found very useful is actually scalp acupuncture. And a lot of times, what I like to do is combine scalp acupuncture together with the manual therapy. So when a patient comes into my clinic, and we're going to apply, let's say he has Parkinson's in this case. So I'll needle the points that are necessary for treating the Parkinson's. In this case, we're gonna be using Yamamoto new scalp acupuncture. And then put him under uh, exercises. So I could be do doing with him uh, coordination exercises or movement exercises, balance exercises, or even in some cases, uh, Tai Chi, uh, Qi Kong, or in some cases even dance around with them, okay? It is known that what was known once about Parkinson's that when the patient, once the patient was diagnosed, I'm talking about a couple of years ago, uh, 15 years ago, even more. And once a patient was diagnosed with Parkinson's, up to after about five years, he will already end up in a wheelchair. Okay? But actually they've started discovering that it's not, not not entirely true. We actually started taking the dopamine, okay, all the drugs that have uh, contained dopamine, you have after five years, you have a good period. And then after five years, you'll start, you'll be in a wheelchair and actually the degeneration will start happening faster and faster. But actually what they have started to see in, in studies have started to show up and show that actually when the patient is also active or physically active as well, that also prolongs uh, prolongs till the uh, Parkinson's will start uh, appearing. For example, I have a patient that it took him, he's a, today he's around 80, 85, okay? And for many years, he was actually only suffering from a smell disorder. And we know one of the symptoms, first symptoms that appear uh, when a patient might have Parkinson's that the smell is decreased. So he's having difficulty in smelling things. And actually this patient, uh, and yet every, every now and then like a, a sore back or, or something like that. But actually what in that stage he was starting to, and he was kind of slow, okay? slow, but not too slow. Uh, he didn't have the classical Parkinson walk or the classical Parkinson uh, physical uh, appearances. So they had very much, it was very difficult for them to uh, diagnose him with uh, Parkinson's. And one of the reasons for this, that he used to do uh, folk dancing. Every evening for about an hour and a half to two hours, he used to go folk dancing, like nearly every evening. So actually what they discovered that actually the dancing prolonged the appearance uh, of the Parkinson's. And only, I think, two, three years ago, they actually diagnosed him finally with Parkinson's. Then he really started becoming very, very slow. The mimics of the face started changing. There was no mimics, this frozen face. And he, when he was walking, his arms weren't swinging. So that, when they, uh, and the posture of the uh, tilt bent forward, and they, they finally diagnosed him with uh, Parkinson's disease. So as you can see, you want to combine multidisciplinary treatments on this patient. So that's the first thing I want to speak about in general when you're treating a Parkinson's patient. Now, if you come into the idea of Chinese acupuncture, you have to, uh, the general uh, diagnosis a lot of times of uh, is a lack of yang or yang or liver or insulting stomach and spleen or earth. And because it insults the spleen and the earth, you have uh, damage to the earth and you have damp heat or damp cold in the earth. And then it actually can't control uh, the metal uh, metal element. Okay, and then the metal element insults uh, wood and then wood uh, decreases more, less and less and less. And then you have this uh, whole cycle. 
okay? Because uh, uh, you have this rigidity and this closeness and the stiffness in the center. One of, if you want to think of the idea what they do in physiotherapy with these uh, Parkinson patients, they tell them think big, okay? Make your mo movements bigger, okay? Make your mo more flexible, more motion, more movement. Okay, so that's actually increasing again the yang, letting the yang or letting the wood element grow. Okay, that also suppress kind of the metal element and then push because now we have dampness and the area of the uh, earth energy is stuck. Okay, because that's also concentration and centeredness, which is earth. Now you don't have movement of the earth, so the muscles are moving, there's no movement. And then you increase in the wood. It's actually now given having a, in the if first stage it was negative effect on the earth. Now it's actually having a positive effect on the earth and then getting the earth to move. And then again, the earth is going to grow, be more, uh, more in contact or more uh, balanced. And then the metal energy is going to shrink and then uh, wood will be thrown. So actually, this is what you're basically doing. Also, the idea is when you come and you practice in, let's say, uh, Tai Chi or uh, Do uh, Ying with the patients, you want more larger movements, maybe all those turning movements, okay, with them, or uh, moving or balance, moving from one foot to another foot, and you want the motion to be very, very large, like the idea of Yang, okay, large, and that actually actually improve uh, their treatments, and this is what we do a lot in the hospital when we have a physiotherapist that uh, does uh, Tai Chi and uh, doing with the patients. So before we come and we speak about uh, the ZS point, we have to understand that there's a master who developed, who discovered the YNSA method. So the YNSA method stands for Yamamoto New Scalp Acupuncture Method. This work of Dr. Yamamoto today is around 92 years old. About uh, April 2021, he, at the age of 92, he retired from clinical practice, okay? His life work was to develop uh, his uh, method of scalp acupuncture. And now, in different from scalp acupuncture, Yamamoto's method is more of a microsystem, okay? And actually it's a microsystem which is broken down to different types of little somo somatotops throughout the system, okay? And it's categorized in about four, uh, four to five groups, depending on how you look at it. But there's four major groups that each point or each area or each group of points has uh, some type of effect on the patient, okay? Now also Dr. Yamamoto is a Japanese uh, anesthesiologist. This is where he started as a Japanese anesthesiologist. He finished his medical school in 1956. And uh, in the, uh, he, to make a long story short, he traveled to the United States. In the United States, he done an internship. After a couple of years in the United States in anesthesiology, he flew to, uh, uh, Germany. In Germany, then, uh, he specialized in obstetrics and gynecology. And then he flew back to his hometown in Japan, uh, the, uh, Meizaki, Nichina, Noishima area, which is very, about two hours from Kyoto, south of Kyoto, which is around the, uh, the southwest island of Japan, uh, like kind of a tropical area but also a tropical area where there's a lot of agriculture going on. So in the first years, the patients that were coming into Dr. Yamamoto's clinic were patients that were suffering from different uh, disorders of pain due to the hard labor and the hard work in the fields. And in the first years, Yamamoto never ever it was not using acupuncture. He was using uh, Western medicine to treat the, their pain. Okay, and what he was basically using a lot was neuroblock uh, or lidocaine. Okay, and if just to make a closed uh, idea that when, it, when you in inject a drug into a patient, you never inject the drug itself, only the drug. It has a saline, like a vessel 
for the drug which is uh, uh, injected or given the injection. And the story actually, when Yamamoto started uh, moving into the idea of acupuncture, started out because of a patient. Yamamoto was, uh, was his first accident that a patient that had a, a three months prolapse disc in the lower back with strong radiated pain came into his clinic and he looked for a sensitive area in the lower back. And, and it, when he found the sensitive area in the lower back, he gave her the injection to this patient. This patient, Yamamoto, mentioned that she responded to the injection in a very peculiar way. She felt a very sharp stabbing sensation. Okay, and she went home. But what she remembered that the injection was very, very painful. She went home, and the next day, actually, when she came back to the clinic, Yamamoto was actually sure that she's going to be uh, charging for a medical malpractice. And actually, came to thank him and say that the, she feels amazing and the pain is gone and she feels great. And this is was Yamamoto's first accident that started bringing him into the the world of acupuncture. And he slowly, slowly started uh, studying acupuncture. Uh, he was very much influenced by uh, the idea of microsystems. So auricotherapy, nasal acupuncture, wrist and ankle acupuncture, balance method, all these methods were we very much influenced him in the clinic. And he was using them. Now from my encounter of Yamamoto, what you can see here on the image on the right, on the left, this is, was the last time, was a couple of times I uh, traveled to Japan and studied under Yamamoto, I done his seminar. And this is from the last, uh, about eight years ago, uh, last time I was there. And you have to understand that Yamamoto is always looking for a better way to treat the patients and get the patients. He first, the, the center of his idea is that the patient is in the center. And what you want to do is get the patient's well-being is the most important. And there's no ego there, okay? So a lot of times you can see him trying different methods to ease the pain of the patient. And that's what he was doing uh, in the first years. And slowly, slowly also after he started using acupuncture, he started using acupuncture also in, uh, 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 general, as a general anesthesia. Okay, in the surgery rooms, we're talking about thousands of uh, operations. And he was using it in his clinic to uh, subside and improve the patient's quality of life and the, the pain that he was complaining about. Now, as you can see, it was very, very effective with microsystems. And when in 1970, Jiao uh, scalp acupuncture was first published, Yamamoto went and studied the Jial style of scalp acupuncture, and he started using it in his clinic. Slowly, slowly, he became more specialized in it, and he was getting the results that he wanted. And he was actually very, getting very uh, good results with the scalp acupuncture. And then what he claims that he had another accident, where he started stumbling onto the, where the first point that he discovered of his method. And the first uh, point of his method if we look in here in this image, okay, that we see the image here, and if we, if you're fam familiar with uh, scalp acupuncture or the Chinese scalp acupuncture, you have two general lines. You have motor line, okay, and sensory line. They go up to around do 20 and do 21 here. Okay, and each the upper area here is going to affect the upper ex, uh, extremity, uh, sorry, the legs, and as you go down will be the thorax and the upper extremities, and down here will be in the area of the face. And a patient walked into this clinic, and she was suffering. He was suffering actually from uh, spasm in the shoulder, mobility in the shoulder, and pain in the shoulder. And when Yamamoto was actually looking for the area of the shoulder in the, this microsystem of the Chinese scalp acupuncture, his finger was placed around about here, okay? And around about here. And this area was very, very sensitive, sensitive and tender for the patient. And actually when Yamamoto pressed down on this point, the patient felt a relief in the shoulder, okay? an instant relief in the shoulder and more mobility in the shoulder. That with the years to become, will become Yamamoto's first point that he discovered, which was the C point, the letter C point, just so you understand, I'm speaking about the letter C point, 
which has an upper effect on the upper extremities. Now, knowing Yamamoto, from my encounters, Yamamoto doesn't say, okay, it works on one person, this point is good for shoulder. He checks this on a, a large amount of patients, and when he sees it has an effect in about an 85% effect on the patient, he said, okay, this point is very, very useful for the shoulder. Now, so this was the first point. And then Yamamoto actually started connecting the dots. What do I mean connecting dots? Connecting between Chinese acupuncture in the area of the head, Chinese scalp acupuncture, and his idea and his method. And then he said, okay, if we have do 24 up here, it has an effect on the mind that's going to affect the brain. And if we go slightly lateral, we're going to have the area of the neck. And then we have the area of the shoulder, which I discovered, the area in between the neck. And as you go down throughout the whole hairline, he discovered more and more points. And those he had about eight to nine for basic points. At each point, treated a different area of the body. Okay? And that was for the, the whole fundamental of uh, his method. And in about two, in nine, 2000, in uh, 1973, he published his work about this point and he called it new scalp acupuncture, just to say that it is different from the Chinese scalp acupuncture. Now, his method is a microsystem, okay? Like if you're familiar with Chinese scalp acupuncture, threading technique is very, very important. But in his method, what is uh, important is actually locating a tender area or a sensitive area, and then which correlates with where the problem is coming from or the cause of the problem, and then insert the needle into there, like acupuncture, just like we do in acupuncture points throughout the body. There's no threading technique, okay? Now, also, it's not necessary to manipulate the needle. One of the ideas is that when the needle's inserted, all the mimics of the face, the twitching of the eyes, the movement of the neck, that's enough to stimulate the points. So it's not necessary to stimulate the points. Needles that are recommended to use, you can use, I use in my clinic 20 by 30, uh, has very good results, but you can use 25 by 40, that's coming from the scalp acupuncture. And also the direction is not important, okay? Direction and angle of needling is also not important. What is important is that the edge of the needle reaches that sensitive point. And a lot of times you'll start feeling that that sensitive point has a little granule. And that's what you want to need. So coming back now to the idea that Yamamoto was very much affected by this idea of mirror reflections. And in the first cases, he always used to try and use the points, what is called on the yin aspect, okay, on that, which is spread out the basic points on the anterior hairline. Okay, when those points did not have any effect, he started thinking what is the mirror reflection of these points on the posterior area and look for the points on the posterior area. And the posterior area, you have a little another microsystem, another somatotop, which actually is spread out on the lamoid suture. For example, for that idea, think that your nose, okay, is similar to the occipital protuberance. So the occipital protuberance is gonna act as your nose in this case, okay? Where the, the forehead, Okay, in the forehead is going to, the whole occipital bone is going to be like the forehead. Okay, and that was uh, the general idea of Yamamoto. Now there's, in the Yamamoto scalp acupuncture, there's no theory between yin, yin and yang theory. It's more like saying yin aspect and yang aspect. And that's the general idea. So it's like, like saying anterior aspect yin, posterior aspect yang. When in 95 to 98% of the treatments are done on the yin aspect, but when the points on the yin don't work, you move to look for them on the yang, or you have an area of diagnosis to know if you work with yin and yang. Which brings me to another thing, which is different from the Chinese scalp acupuncture. Yamamoto scalp acupuncture is based on palpation-based acupuncture. And what does it mean? That not necessarily you'll needle the points according to the symptoms of the patients, but also the Yamamoto discovered a couple of diagnostic areas throughout the body, which allow you to tell you which side the points need to be needled and which point needs to be needled and what area needs to be needled to treat the cause of the problem. The diagnostic areas are in the neck, the abdomen, and the elbow areas, okay? 
But for us today, the webinar, they're less important, uh, these diagnostic areas, okay? So going back to the idea of Yamamoto, so from those basic points, developed all these microsystems. And this is just an example on the, on the right side where you can see my mouse, where all these uh, microsystems uh, were developed. So you have basic points here, you have young points, you have brain points, the elbow diagnosis, certain protocols for tinnitus, you have the internal organs, uh, channels, and etc. But everything is more of a microsystem, which is different from the Chinese scalp acupuncture idea. And he, for about 50 years, was practicing and developing, this is his life work of the system. In his years he, uh, of working, he has a hospital that he uh, established where Yamamoto scalp acupuncture was being used. He has a rehabilitational clinic where it was used and an old age home also where it was used. So this is uh, this amazing uh, human being by the name of Dr. Tushikatsu Yamamoto, that this was his life work. And, by honoring him, I want to help as much patients as possible because this was always when I was there. He said, the patient is most important. So like no ego. So this is why I want to spread the knowledge as much as possible. So more patients will actually receive the benefits of the Yamamoto New Scalp Acupuncture Method. So coming now into one of the points, which is... Uh, which we, which this is the topic today, which is the ZS point. So the ZS point it, it stands for the German physician, medical doctor by the name of Dorothea Zeissus, who discovered this point. She uh, was the person who discovered this point. As you can see, she's a general uh, medical practitioner. She specializes as well in gynecology and hormonal problems with, with females. She's also uh, known with uh, neuropathic uh, treatments. And she also uh, teaches in uh, General Medical uh, University in Heidelberg. Okay. Also, if you're very interested in her work, she has amazing work on a lot of points, a lot of how to use certain points. She has a lot of articles. Unfortunately for me, I'm not German speaking, so I have difficulty reading her articles and I have to do kind of a Google Translate. And even there, Google doesn't translate it so well. So, uh, Dorothea Zaisus is who discovered the ZS point. And Yamamoto accepted the ZS point into his method, but by saying it's not his point to discover, and I in my couple of encounters with Dr. Yamamoto, I asked him about this point and he kept saying to me, it's, it's not my point. I less deal with gynecology and hormonal uh, problems. Uh, he recommended me for me to approach Dorothea Zaisus herself. So uh, thank you, Dorothea, for discovering also this amazing point. So before we go into the point, I wanna show you this amazing uh, use of the point on a Parkinson's patient. This is a Parkinson patient that I treated uh, twice a week in the first, uh, when I started the treatment, he's 82 years old. We started treating him twice a week. Okay, slowly, slowly, I could treat him once a week because the effects were holding for a longer period of time till I got to a stage that I could treat him for once every three weeks. I used to come and uh, treat him. Now, unfortunately, uh, Parkinson patients are kind of, because of the degenerative uh, disorder, they're going to constantly need treatment. Not necessarily every week, but if they can afford every week, the more yeah, that's great. But if not, you can get to a stage that every three weeks, every uh, four weeks, uh, you uh, treat them. Again, slowly, slowly, you see that the effects... But it's not like they straight away have this amazing effect and have, they stay at this amazing uh, level. It goes, it goes, it's like going two steps forward, one and a half steps back. Two steps forward, one and a half steps back. So think that one and a half slowly, slowly improves and improves and improves in the long term uh, effect on the patient. So until you get to a stage that they have like a plateau stage, they actually stay at the same level. And then you just kind of keep it in that, at that level that they don't degenerate or slower down the degeneration 
uh, on the patient. But again, like I said, if they do manual therapy or any exercises actually prolongs them in a very, very good state. So this is the 83 year old patient. And you'll see uh, two videos. One, the same video of the same patient. One will be before I needle uh, the ZS point. Okay, and the second will be after I needle, directly after I needle the ZS point. So here you can see the patient's walk, very classical Parkinson walk. He doesn't have arm swing, he's slightly tilted forward. He has a small gliding on the feet. He's having difficulty raising his feet. Now we're asking to walk through this, uh, the corridor and through the door and, he's, and he freezes. Okay, that's very classic. Now, what you see is the patient be needled bilaterally, as you can see here. I mean, not bilaterally, on the yin aspect and the posterior aspect. We'll speak about the difference between these two points and why in Parkinson's you want to needle both of these points. Okay. And, uh, and a lot of times in the cases of Parkinson's, just take it, I'll speak about it again, but when symptoms only appear on one side of the body, these points are actually needled contralateral. Okay, but when the symptoms are appearing on both sides, they needled epsilateral. Now there's a diagnostic area in the area of the neck for these points, which is around about stomach 12. That helps you to assess if you needle the point in the correct area. We'll speak about it again. So this is about two minutes after these points have been needled, and it's only these points. So look how fast he gets up. He has more freedom of motion. He's even swinging his hands a bit more. Hey, Grace, he's quite he's smiling there. Okay, he's a, 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 uh, astonished by the results of this patient. So uh, I will show you it. So that's that point. Okay, so. As I said, Dorothea Zaisus goes through two stages of discovering uh, the, about the effect on uh, this point. In 2007, uh, Dorothea Zaisus done a, a self-study in a clinic on over 271 females. And she was needling this point uh, on 271 females, running ages from 18 to 64. And she divided into four groups. One group were the female with hot flashes, okay? And one and three different groups of menstruation disorders, amenorrhea, dysmenorrhea, but menstruation irreg irregularity, okay? The cycle was irregular, okay? And all these women were asked to chart down if they have improvement or not improvement. They had a diary and they charted it down. Now, these women were needled bilaterally, on, only on the yin aspect, bilaterally, because that's in the first year she only discovered the yin aspect, bilaterally, and put in a, a quiet room for uh, a couple of, uh, for about 45 minutes with relaxing music. All these women, 99% of these females, running from three months to six months, started speaking about improvement. Patients with menstruation disorders, their menstrual cycle became regular. So the women with the heat flashes, the heat flashes calmed down and were reduced, okay? So this was the first study that she was doing. And then she published a paper about that work. Now in the paper, it's mentioned that there's no control group. There was no uh, control group done. And in the discussion of the paper, she mentions that she's have, she is speculating that the point on the yin aspect has an effect on the hypophysa area. Now, if we go to the idea of Chinese scalp acupuncture that we spoke that the areas that are needled, and if we, areas that are needled on the Chinese scalp acupuncture match the anatomy of the brain of that area of the homunculus, for example, the motor and the sensory line, okay? Match the homunculus. The same idea here, if you look at the yin aspect, a kind of matches up with the area where the hypophysa is located in the brain. So that's the general idea of this point. Now, 
she 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 has an uh, estimated has an effect on the fees. Now, if we think about now, this is the, one of the only points that that also started to bring it to discover the young aspect was that between yin and yang theory. So if you're thinking about the yin aspect point, the yin has a uh, yin effect on the patient. So she, you can speculate that it has some effect on astrogen. And actually by doing biochemistry on the patient, she actually discovered that the page has a the point on the yin aspect affects the astrogen levels of the patient. Now, you'll see that astrogen also has an effect on dopamine, okay? Uh, as some type of effect on dopamine, it allows dopamine to uh, channel uh, better through the body and through the brain. So that's one thing. Then when she was looking, this is the biochemistry that she started doing also, patients that had high prolactin levels. Now, if you come to the idea of prolactin, prolactin is again yin aspect or a yin idea in the brain. And what you want to do is actually give some stimulation of yang to lower the levels of prolactin. So prolactin has this very, well, has different effect on the patient, but what it, the cause of it will cause ir irregulation. One of the bad effects of irregulation of uh, the woman's uh, menstruation cycle, also page will uh, have a very strong effect on uh, fertility and pregnancy, okay? It'll lower, it has an effect also on, in the males, it can affect the lowering the levels of testosterone and also affect the estrogen and lower the effect of estrogen on the on the females. And she started lo looking for the point on the yang aspect. And actually, what she started found, and then this was all done by biochemistry, she found the location of the yang aspect and she started needling it. And actually, it started lowering lowering the levels of uh, prolactin. And she mentions in the paper that actually the yang aspect has a can substitute the drug of boromaxeripitin. Okay, boromaxeripitin is a drug to lower prolactin levels. Now that drug is also a drug that that can be given to Parkinson's patients. Why? Because it has it has dopamine in it. And the antagonist of prolactin is actually dopamine. Okay, so if you want to lower prolactin, just give dopamine and, and lowers. And that's the substitute the drug. And actually what she started also seeing that some of these patients started showing symptoms of a high overdose of uh, dopamine. So just so we have an idea what symptoms might have been occurring. So first of all, what is the effect of prolactin of the body? So prolactin affects the body. Prolactin stimulation uh, stimul stimulates breast development and milk production in women. There is no known uh, normal function of prolactin in men. So men shouldn't have prolactin. Okay? Now, what will happen when you have high levels of prolactin? Too much prolactin reduces the production of the hormone estrogen and testosterone. So it actually lowers uh, estrogen levels and lowers uh, testosterone levels. So you can understand that at that point, unlike males, will uh, allow, raise the one cause to help to raise uh, estrogen if they're caused it because they have high uh, prolactin. Now, cause for prolactin could be a, a tumor, which is uh, causing, a, especially in kids or in elderly, that are showing symptoms of high prolactin. So, one of the so, like I said, she started seeing that some of these patients were starting to show high uh, symptoms of high uh, dopamine levels. So, what happens when dopamine levels are very high? You see increased, you'll see an increased high libido, anxiety, difficulty of sleeping, increased energy, mania, stress and uh, improvement in ability of focus and learning. So dopamine is one of the learning drugs. So we think that it may, may, may very focuses them. So it makes them also very, very focused on what they're doing. So you can think that you could use it, for example, for people with ADHD, you, know, you want to focus them. Okay, that's all these symptoms are among others. All these symptoms have uh, dopamine effects in a positive and a negative uh, manner. 
So how does uh, dopamine, what is the dopamine function in the human body? So dopamine plays an important role in extensive uh, functions, motor control, motivation, essential reinforcement, and reward through significantly uh, case studies that are increased via bind binding dopagenic receptors at the uh, production function of a substance nigra. Okay? So basically, the dopamine levels affect certain areas of the brain. It affects the, the frontal lobe. So that's why it's also going to affect the reward center. Okay, also the motivation level. Also the creativity uh, level. That's one thing it affects. Another effect is the substance nigra area, which you have the basal ganglion area. So that's going to also affect um, motor function or motor movements. Okay, and also... Has effect because it has an effect on uh, adrenaline and uh, nipper adrenaline and new adrenaline, so it's also going to affect the area of uh, the limbic center, okay, the reward center, or making you more happy, and etc. So, how does that affect uh, how does astrogen now also affect dopamine? Astrogen uh, decreases the release of GABA, so you think that you have you suppress GABA, okay, so you have more, you're more outgoing, for example, you're more happy or more confident in some manner, because it's that inhibitor, I mean, it's more of an inhibitor effect GABA in the brain. So main ability in neurotransmitter in the brain, promoting increased uh, glutamate and dopamine transmission, okay, so it actually improves the transmission of dopamine, and then it's going to affect also the the kidney areas, okay, the adrenal gland in the sort of effect, the epinephrine and the adrenaline in the, human, in the human being. And that's why you can see the patients, they start showing access dopamine, have all these symptoms of anxiety, lack of sleep, very concentrated, this mania. That's what happens when they have the high levels. And even in some cases, it goes to a stage that they have hallucinations. So let's show you the location of these two amazing points, okay? So the location of the points, so first of all, I'm going to draw up my uh, board here, okay? So as I said, Yamamoto divides yin and yang, so we need to divide the scalp into yin and yang. So if you would fold the ear here onto the tragus area, you'll come to an area here which is called the apex line, I like to call the apex line, and this line stretches right up to about do 20. Okay, and that divides between yin aspect, yin aspect, and yang aspect. Yang aspect. And then we need to locate the points. Now, if you're familiar with the epsilon points, I'll show you how to, where you, the location. It's actually a junction is created when you have Three or four organs: the lung point, uh, lung point, uh, pericard point, small intestine point, and uh, stomach point. The, in the integration of the junction between the two, three, four points, will give you to the uh, ZS point on the in aspect, and the same on the Yang reflection. But there's an easier way to locate it, and because not everyone on this webinar are familiar with uh, the Yang as with YNSA. I'm just gonna show you how the easiest way to locate these points. So first of all, what you wanna do, you have the yin and the yang. The next, what you wanna do is understand where the anterior hairline is, okay? That's important. And now we need the mid forehead line. The mid forehead line is a line that actually runs from the most anterior part of the temporalis muscle. The temporalis muscle, as you can see here, goes to an area of the anterior point. Okay, from there, which is about the mid forehead line from the anterior aspect of the temporalis muscle to do 17, which is around about here. So we have that line there. You'll see that this line is important for what we want to do. So we have that what's called the mid forehead line. Okay. So now how do we locate? So as I mentioned, 
just so you know what I spoke about the lung, this area is what is called the lung epsilon point on the yin aspect. This is pericard on the yin aspect organ. This is small intestine. And this is stomach. Okay, so if you would cross lines between lung to stomach and small intestine to pericard, you'll come to around about here. That's the ZS yin aspect. That's one way, an easier way to understand. First of all, the area on the yin aspect is the most deepest point, very, very close to Tai Yang point in the temporal region. Now, why is it the deepest point in the temporal region? Because you have three suitors that meet there. You have the coronal suitor that comes down from the coronal or divides between the parietal bones and the frontal bones coming down. And you have the... Uh, the parietal and the zygomatic area of the suture, and they all meet in this region here. They meet in this region here, which is the deepest area in the temporal region. And that's the ZS in aspect. Another way to locate it, if you go to the most anterior point of the temporalis, and you go about half a centimeter down on the hairline, and then start moving back palpation, till they fall into a big divot, okay? That is the ZS point on the in aspect. Now, if you want to be sure of that point, what you want to do is you're going to palpate the area of stomach 12, okay? So I'm just going to uh, stop sharing my screen. No, you're going to palpate the area of stomach 12. You're going to go to that area of the point, okay? You're going to feel the, the tension of the muscle in stomach 12. When you feel the muscle reduces or the sensitivity in stomach 12 reduces, you know you're in the correct point. So that'll show you where the ZS on the yin aspect is. Now coming to the yang aspect, the yang aspect is slightly more complicated, but also will make it uh, very, very easy. So we have that mid forehead line, okay? Now another line we need to know is basically try to understand where this lung epsilon point is located. So if, we, if you can see here, I'll try to do it in white. But this is the mastoid bone, and this is kind of the mastoid suture. Okay, and it goes up to about there. Okay? If you go posterior to the mastoid bone, you can even slightly see it here. There's like a crease, okay? That's on the gallbladder channel. So you go to this line here, which is about here. You actually, now you're in the lamoid suture, okay? The lamoid uh, suture area. From there, you imagine or you draw a direct 90 degree line going up till you meet that mid forehead point. Okay, that line that runs between the mid forehead to do 17. So you meet, meet that area and that's gonna be, like I said, the lung epsilon point on the young aspect. Okay, then now, if now you have that one point, a landmark. The next landmark you need to locate is actually a divot that is located if behind the ear, round about here. That's the end of the mastoid, actually the mastoid bone. So what you wanna do, if you palpate your mastoid process and you go up towards the ear around about there, you found a divot. And then what you wanna do in that divot, you're gonna cross a line, an imaginary line from that divot there towards that, what we call the lung epsilon point. So let me just write down lung here. So, you know, I'm speaking about lung epsilon point and here lung, okay? Now, what you wanna do on this line, you wanna divide this line into thirds, okay? Into three, so you have one, two. When you go to the upper, the lower border of the upper posterior third, which is around about here, that is the area of the location of the ZS Yang aspect. So that's the ZS Yang aspect. And again, palpate this point with the, I mean, stomach 12 point with the point in the uh, posterior area. And when it releases in the area of the neck, you know you're in the correct point. But just know that the divot there is going to be fluffy or some abnormality you'll feel there when the, the patient has Parkinson's or any uh, high levels of prolactin. 
So uh, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can see me, what I was doing. Okay, so if I have stomach 12 around about here, okay, and I have the point here, so I'm palpating stomach 12, feeling the sensitivity. Here I have my mid forehead line, almost the anterior part of my temporis, and I just slightly go down and then go back, look for a deep hole. When it releases in the neck, I know I'm in the point. On the Nyang aspect, it's difficult for me to show, but the same idea I'll be playing around about here, this idea. So that's uh, the location of these uh, two points. Go in my screen. Okay. Okay, so, so that's uh, our ZS. Another idea of a ZS, whoever's familiar with YNSA, you can see it's the cross, cross junctions kind of when you draw a line from lung to stomach and pericard to small intestine in the center. The same on the young aspect between lung to stomach, pericard to small intestine. That's where the location of the, the point would be. So now I'll show you another video of uh, the point. So what I want to show you here, the idea of that Im imaging that matches the, the points. So what we can see here is a substant nigra area. Okay, and this is, goes to the idea of Chinese scalp acupuncture, the neuroanatomy. So basically, this area approximately here is uh, located what you, uh, around about here, okay, just where I showed you the location of the point. Okay, that's the area of the substance nigra area. Oh, so that's why it's going to have effect on motor function or motor function of Parkinson's patients in one level. Because if you remember what happens in Parkinson patients, the, the receptors that uh, connect to dopamine are damaged. And then the dopamine doesn't connect to the receptors or actually Lewy bodies or protein cells sink on the receptors and cause the, the receptors to go to sleep. So there's no uptake, intake of the dopamine. And kind of, uh, because no intake dopamine, dopamine levels go down and down and down and down. And the patient uh, is not receiving any intake of dopamine. So this is why in the first stages you see motor functions and slowly, slowly start seeing disorders of uh, cognitive problems. So you'll see a lack of motivation, tiredness, lack of memory, blood, blood levels that are popping up and down, nutrition, hungry or not hungry, sunny, they feel fatigued because they have a glucose uh, sinking. So that's a, a large effect on the patient and slowly, slowly, they become more rigid and the memory and everything. They found themselves in a wheelchair till they kind of don't communicate with themselves. 
and that sits right, and that's an idea of the area of the substance, the nigger, because that's where it's secreted, the dopamine, okay? The next area that we showed you, the yin aspect, which is around about here, which is also in the area which is around about here, which is actually the area of the hypophysa. So this is the idea why yin and yang, okay? What, what you want to uh, use of the patients. Now, from my experience, what I've actually found, when you come in to deal with a Parkinson's paper, there's three ways to use these points. Uh, basically, when you want to uh, affect the patients, only lower the levels of the prolactin levels, so I do recommend to just use the yang aspect, okay? When you see a patient that has high levels of prolactin, the yang from my, uh, the yang will lower their prolactin levels and kind of can be a game changer in the treatment, okay? When the patient uh, is showing uh, low levels of estrogen, then you're only going to needle the yin aspect, okay? So, because that has an effect on estrogen, but raises the levels of estrogen, so it'll be very effective in administration, uh, will be very effective in uh, menopause syndrome, okay? So the heat flashes, the mood swings, the dryness, uh, you name it, okay? So it's also going to be very, very effective on, on that side. And usually you're going to needle it according to the side that is sensitive in uh, the stomach 12. When you're dealing with pro Parkinson's patients, what you want to do is actually needle these points uh, uh, on the yin aspect and yang aspect. Remember, because you want to lower the levels of prolactin because the yang aspect has more of a dopagenic effect. And we know that the estrogen has an effect on dopamine and around trans transformation or re uh, the dopamine to connect better or transverse through the system better. So you also want to use the one on the yin aspect. Yeah, that's why you combine the two. Now, when the symptoms in Parkinson's are the only contralateral on, on one side of the body, you're going to needle these points contralateral. So, for example, if it's a period on my left side, I'll needle these points on my uh, right side of the scalp. If the points, when, when the symptoms are bilaterally, I'll needle them uh, bilaterally. Now, these the specific uh, use of these points are specific. Now, also, you can already take it to your clinic because I like a lot of times I want to, the rest is open for imagination. And the, this idea, I also want to take your clinic. So when you re realize or the patient is showing symptoms of low levels of dopamine and not necessarily Parkinson's, maybe it's worth also using these points. Or a woman is showing uh, menstruation disorders or uh, high levels sometimes of uh, when patients are showing uh, anxiety, for example, and you want to kind of balance it out, you can also use these points. Because the idea is in Japanese acupuncture, it more balances than it does a pit up or a lower. Okay, So that's uh, about these points. Now, I want to speak to you of another idea. It's also, I found it's very, very useful. Uh, Alamoto has what's called uh, master key points. Now, one of uh, Yamoto has master key points that are located right in the in the posterior area around the occipital pertuberance. Now, the master key points he has a master key point for tinnitus, which is actually do sixteen, so it has an effect on tinnitus, and we do know that do sixteen has some effect on the brain because it brings the yang chia or yang way, and that's another way to communicate with the brain. And also we know one of the ways to communicate with the brain is through the do channel and through the bladder channel, okay? So that's one way uh, of connecting with the brain, so it's very good for tinnitus. And if you feel the occipital pertuberance and you go slightly to the side, okay, you have the dibit there on the, on the bone, okay? The upper area of that dibit is gonna affect the upper body. It's like giving a boost to the treatment of the body. And uh, slightly below it, we have the lower body. It affects from the upper body's diaphragma up, lower body is from diaphragma down, and you needle these points a lot of times epsilateral. Now, if you go to Zhu scalp acupuncture uh, method, all this area here, when needled in a certain direction, more of a threading zone, actually the idea is opening up the brain. It's very good for wind, tremor, 
uh, ticks, okay? And that's very, very effective from the Zhu style. So there's the combination between Yamamoto and Zhu idea. Now there's another master key point that Yamamoto uses, which is, uh, I want to, Another uh, master key point, which is being used, which is around uh, the connection between C2 to C3. On the area of the Huato Giagi points, very close between uh, C2 to 3. You have an area of the throat, so that's a master key point for the throat, for, good, for laryngitis, the thyroid gland, and the parathyroid gland. And then you have on the segments of the versus trend segments of the C2 area, you have a master key point for Parkinson's. Now, what happens when you need those points? It actually releases tension in the area of the neck. Now, Try to understand why these points have some effect on uh, on Parkinson's. They're actually very, very useful for a release in tension of uh, rigidity. Okay, so it's very good for rigidity. Now, I I started stumbling onto uh, channel theory. If we have channel theory, also according to Yamamoto, Dr. Yamamoto also mentions that the vagus nerve has a very strong effect on the parasympathetic nerve system. Why? Because it's rest and digest. So when you stimulate or invade, uh, stimulate, innovate the vagus nerve, you're going to cause the patient to re re relax, okay? Because the, the digestive system now is functioning. Now, if we go to the area, another that was difficult to needle the vagus nerve and stimulate it, but a lot of time, and the, the vagus nerve actually comes out through the posterior area around C1, comes out of the area of the brain, then goes slightly down and then goes anteriorly and comes inwards towards the, to innovate the digestive system. And then and that area of the meeting point, a lot of times when you have tension or a lot of neck stress, okay, in the area of the neck, it's going to influence the vagus nerve. So in YNSA, you can think that the parasympathetic nerve system is not activated and the patient is in a, in a stage of hyper uh, or activation of flight mode, more of the sympathetic nerve system. So everything is activated more. So if you can think about it, he has a lot of activation of dopamine. So the dopamine is kind of out of balance. Okay? And he's like in a lot of stress. And if you keep on with that stress, muscles will contract, spasm will start. If you have to too much spasm, it's like starting the uh, tremor and the, the tremor. So actually the way, and you have the glossopharyngeal. Now the glossopharyngeal and the vagus are actually the whole large intestine channel. We know the large intestine channel is the whole digestive system from the throat going down. So you have actually the connection of the yang ming. If you think about it, yang ming tunifies blood and qi. So you want to get you tunify qi and blood. And that's general idea of channel theory. Now the way to actually innovate it or actually reduce pressure is that area around C2. So when you needle in that area, the master key point of C2, you actually in some way influence in the vagus nerve, which is allowing to innovate better. And by innovating better, it means the patient will go into a stage of re re relax, okay? And this will cause the rigidity to lower. So this is kind of the connection between the vagus nerve the glossopharyngeal nerve and this area of the master key points of Yamamoto in the posterior area of the scalp. These master key points and why these master key points are very, very good for uh, Parkinson's as well. So with that, uh, I'll finish up and uh, say thank you for all of you for watching this webinar. I hope you very much enjoyed it. You, if you want to uh, catch base of us and go uh, hear more from us. You can go to uh, visit our website. There's a website, email. Uh, you can send us an email if you have any questions and uh, feel free. Thank you very much for coming. I always like to say thank you for you for attending and listening to me. As you learn from me, I learn from you. So thank you very much, guys. Have a good day. Have a good evening and have a good week.